Gentlemen, this video is for Wednesday, October 28th, 2020. It's been a day. I don't know what your day has been like, but I know what my day has been like. And I got very little accomplished that I set out to do. I had a really good conversation with Nick. That was great. But other stuff, yeah, there's interruptions constantly. And the reason I'm on the boat doing this is because I had to go home very quickly and take one of our dogs to the veterinarian because he's very, very sick. So, it's been a hectic day. And then I was almost out of gas. Yeah. <laughs> At a day like that, I know you have. When they stack up too many for too long, you have too many of those days in a row, you can get sick. It's called stress. And stress buildup has all kinds of effects on the human body and brain. For instance, because what happens when you're under stress? Well, adrenaline flows into your bloodstream and adrenaline is a powerful stimulant. It kind of tightens up the muscles. It kind of slows down digestion. You breathe shallower, but faster. Narrows your eyesight. Raises your blood pressure like crazy. You get less oxygen from the air. And over time, stress can kill you totally serious. I've been a certified stress manager now for 30 management trainer trainer for 38 years, which is longer than you guys have been on the earth. And I've seen it work. I've seen it in me. One of the most effective means of dealing with stress is through music. Um, particularly what we call classical music. Now, I don't care if you love it or not. doesn't matter. But uh, the effects of music, it's, it's been said for centuries that music has powers to soothe the savage beast. And it's true. Music is God's given means of us expressing our emotions. And it's powerful when it's well done. Um, the effects of music on the brain have been well documented. Certain types of music have been shown to promote healing, increase energy, lower blood pressure, which I can use, relieve migraine headaches, elevate mood, improve digestion, and believe it or not, even increase milk production in cows. Serious. Why? Well, that is well-played music has those effects. Well-sung music has those effects. Poorly performed music has the opposite effect. It increases stress. It does not alleviate it. By poorly played, I mean out of tune. The, the musical notes clash with each other. You heard that in the videos for last week. They're out of rhythm or sync. Uh, the words are difficult or impossible to understand. The musicians are unemotional. The musicians are not fitting or blending their parts with the others. Kind of think of a screech owl in the middle of a dove, pack of doves. Or a crazy drummer. You saw that. There are musicians who act like soloists all the time and don't blend in. Those are problematic and those are issues you will face. If you ever become a worship leader, I guarantee you will face those particular issues. No doubt. So last week I gave you a bunch of videos of really bad church mu musicians. I do hope you watch those. Because they are a forewarning of reality. Um... Do you remember the two women trying to sing Go Tell It on the Mountain? 
What was wrong with that? Uh, just about everything. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Now, what's wrong with that? One, there's nothing behind it. It's dead. There's no emotion there. None. The notes were pretty well correct, but it's totally, completely boring. Now, I haven't done much singing in many years. I do, my voice is trained, but if you don't use it a lot, it's like any other training. It goes away. <clears throat> but it should be something like this. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Yeah, you can hear the scratch in my voice. But it has to have life. Without life, it's meaningless. Nobody listens. Or it's out of tune. Now, as I've said before, I, I've run into numerous people who thought they were excellent singers. They were terrible because they could not hear the music. They were matching what they heard, but what they heard was not the correct tones. And so they, they sounded terrible. So why is it that church musicians tend to be so mediocre? Mediocre, excuse me. Why? There's a simple reason. They don't have a good coach. Call it a conductor, a director, a coach, whatever. I don't care what you call it. But if you don't have a good coach, you'll never be good. Not as a group, not even as a soloist. All the way through college, even though I'd been a soloist in the Army Band, I took private lessons every week with the head of the brass department. Why? Because there was always something I could do better. Always. And as a result, I got to be very, very good. If you don't practice, well, let me, let me rephrase this. Have you ever heard the phrase, practice makes perfect? No, it doesn't. You can practice badly all your life and never be perfect. Perfect practice makes perfect. Perfect. Remember that. But here's the deal. Even amateur musicians can be coaxed into greatness. I am totally serious here. So where are the problem areas? Well, there's a bunch of them. I'm going to try to deconstruct them. One of them is indiction pronunciation. Even a single singer, a, a soloist, can be incomprehensible if they don't enunciate clearly. They can be unintelligible. I don't know if you've ever heard the, I think it was the, by the Kingsman, it's called Luai Luai. I don't think anybody's ever understood the lyrics to that. Not even the Kingsmen. Because they don't pronounce them correctly. Now, one person can get away with being less than perfect, but five cannot. Fifty. No. So, the more singers you have, the greater this problem becomes. They must exaggerate. And the pronunciation of every syllable of every word precisely the same and in the exact same rhythm. Now, did you notice I did what I was saying? Every word must be pronounced precisely. And you're going to have to tell them what that looks like. You're going to have to show them what that looks like by demonstrating it. And then sometimes, believe it or not, you have to get in front of a mirror 
and show them what the mouth looks like when it makes a certain sound. What am I talking about? The difference between ah and oh. Ah, oh. Same note, very different sounds. So, sometimes you, you got to scrunch up the face a little bit, get the face loosened up. Serious. There are face exercises that you can do. Um, so, what happens is you have to rehearse the words dozens of times without the music so that they get but in rhythm so that they get it precisely correct now you're going to have some people who think they're doing it correctly and they're not and you're going to have to correct them that's not necessarily a lot of fun but it is necessary it's one of those things you, you can't get away without doing it and certain consonants have to be exaggerated or suppressed depending on the effect you want to get you'll see some of this what do I mean B B the B sound it's kind of a soft sound but you have to be careful that everybody's doing it not M but B D D B D if you don't do it correctly it's hard to hear the difference how about the word how about the letter K? Sick. Sick. It has to be clear. Everybody has to do it the same. Sick. You hear that little p at the end of it? Sick. Pack. It's the only way to make it clear is that k at the end of it. Letter P, you have to be careful of. P. Because this is where you get what's called the microphone pop. If they're too close to a microphone and they say pa, it goes ping. So you have to be very careful to soften the letter P. S. Oh man. If everybody says S, all you get is a hiss. My practice and the practice of many others is only a third of the people actually pronounce the S at the end of a word or a phrase. Otherwise, you get too much of an S. T, 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 t. That's almost as bad as P. The P. T. Take off. Take off. See how I backed off from that? Take off. Take off. You got to back off from it. It's a nasty little sound. V is very difficult. The, the, V, the. Have to be sure to get it out. And Z. Z, buzz, buzz, business, track. These are consonants, and you have to be careful of which ones you use. Now, you're going to see some examples today of where they are emphasized for effect, and you'll see some where they are the exact opposite. Here's the harder one to learn. Breath support. What the heck is that? Well, brass players know what this is. Because you cannot play a brass instrument without breath support. It is compressing the air in the lungs with the abdominal muscles and forcing it out. You tighten up the abdominal muscles just like somebody's going to hit you in the gut. And whether it's a singer or a wind musician, that changes the tune, that changes the pitch, it changes the quality, it improves it in all areas. Um, it improves the quality of the sound. It gives it a deeper, richer tone. What am I talking about? God bless America. God bless America. Yeah. See the difference? <clears throat> My voice isn't very good anymore, but I know you can tell the difference. It gives a much deeper, greater projection to the voice. It dramatically improves the high range as well. If you've got somebody who can't reach the high notes, 
they got to compress the air, breath support, those abdominal muscles, push, tighten them up, push, and they'll be able to hit those high notes. When I was in college, I was a brass major and a voice minor, um, and uh, my voice instructor used to stand right alongside me, and while I'm singing, without any warning, he would hit me in the gut, and he didn't pull any punches. He hit me hard. If I did not have proper breath support, it would double me over. I could probably have him charged with assault. But if I did, it just bounced off. Didn't make any difference. So breath support is really important. Then there's intonation, which means are the notes in tune with each other? Five trumpets playing the same note perfectly in tune will sound like one trumpet, not five. You'll hear one. That's perfect intonation. The second you begin hearing vibrations between them, they're getting out of tune. I mean, even the tiniest little vibration, they're getting out of tune. Every instrumentalist must tune his instrument to the same pitch. I've seen this before where they, well, I tune up to myself. What? No. Use the keyboard. B flat or C, doesn't matter which. This is the note everybody tunes to. You play it, bam, and they match it, bam, on whatever they're singing or they're playing. If they can't match it, it's out of tune and they adjust their instrument. Okay? Vocalists and instrumentalists must constantly be listening to each other and adjusting to stay in tune. This is why when you see pop recording artists um, going live, they have earbuds in. They're called ears, surprisingly enough. And their one and only thing is to help them hear themselves as they are playing with others. To hear how they are blending in. If they don't do that, they can't hear it. It's too loud. So they use that constantly. Tempo. Nice little Italian word. Tempo is the speed at which the music is played. And almost all music will have a little notation uh, with a musical note equals a number. If that note equals 66, then there's 66 of those notes in a minute. If it says 120, there's 120 of those notes in a minute. And it's incredibly important that we not go too fast or too slow, but they be right about where it's supposed to be. And your nightmare is going to be a drummer who can't keep a tempo. I run into that. All you get then is chaos and confusion. I mean, somebody goes, yeah, da, 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 I mean, you know, come on. That's horrible. That will not work. So tempo is incredibly important. A lack of passion. Music's all about emotion. Music expresses nothing but emotion. It's expressed through voice tone, energy, body movement. One of the reasons Amazing Grace is the most popular song in the entire world is that it cannot be sung without emotion. I don't think you can do it. And the passion that it brings out in the listeners, that can bring tears to your eyes passionless rendition, that's not worth listening to. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. I wish I were somebody else's lunch ready yet. No. But a full-throated song singing, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. 
I may not be good anymore, but that's a whole lot better than what I sang before. See what I mean? The musicians have to show their commitment through their body language. They have to be completely present there, not somewhere else. Why? The brain does not pay attention to boring. You may not be paying attention to me right now because I might be boring. Okay, I get it. Non-committal musicians are always boring. Now, I've seen musicians that were technically perfect, but there was no passion behind it. None. And I've seen musicians who weren't all that great, but there was incredible passion behind it. And it made, made a huge difference. If you can bring all of these things into excellence, you're going to have an amazing result. Let's get on to the illustrations here, okay? I'm going to give you a little background. In 2004, I had the privilege of studying in the country of South Africa. South Africa is literally the southernmost tip of the continent of Africa. It's amazing to stand at the Cape of Good Hope where the Atlantic Ocean and the Indian Ocean meet and look straight out and realize there's nothing between you and Antarctica but water. Lots of water. South Africa is, a, is, a, is an incredible place. For one thing, it's beautiful. Some of the most stunning landscapes anywhere on earth. But that isn't why I was there. I was there to find out something. I wanted to know why they were not in the middle of a bloody civil war. They should have been. Here's the background. Dutch settlers entered South Africa in the 1600s. They had left the Netherlands and they were settling in South Africa. They were looking for room for to farm. Netherlands was crowded. And they were called Boers, B-O-E-R-S. Boer for singular, Boers for plural. The Boers created colonies. They pretty much got along with the natives. And then they discovered gold. Lots of gold. Well, the English heard about this because they thought nothing, they wanted nothing to do with South Africa until suddenly there was gold. So the English sent in soldiers. And the English started to set up colonies in South Africa. And they enslaved the people. And they tried to kick the Boers off of the gold fields. Well, then they discovered diamonds. The world's biggest diamond mine is in South Africa. And greed took over. They began hiring the natives, the blacks, the Zulu, the Kosa, the Indabele, the various tribes, and they began enslaving them. Over the course of a few hundred years, well, in the late 1800s, the Boer War broke out, and it was a war between the Boers and the British, and it was ugly. But then there were also the Zulu Wars, where the Zulu tribes came together under a man named Shaka Zulu and they became the most powerful force in South Africa and they fought the British army. Now the British of course had rifles and pistols and cannons and the Zulus had spears and spears. But they were passionate because they saw their freedom as being taken away completely. They weren't going to have anything to do with it. 
after a series of bloody battles all across South Africa, the British finally, British Army finally pulled out. The Boers took over the government and the Dutch Reformed Church, you need to know this, created a theology of what's called apartheid, means apartness or separateness. And that theology said that anyone whose skin was not white is under the curse of Cain. And the darker your skin, the worse the curse. So if you were jet black, you weren't even human. Well, this justified all kinds of violence against the blacks. They were forced off of their tribal lands into townships. By 1940, and they were forced to work for pennies in the gold mines, in the diamond mines. And a lot of them died there because the conditions were so, so dangerous. And since they were, lots of them, there were always some to take, somebody died, so there was always somebody to take his place. The Boers didn't care. By the mid-1900s, when Germany was a fascist country, a Nazi country under Adolf Hitler, the government of South Africa, which was Boer controlled, backed the Nazis. Now they had another name for themselves because they, they developed a new language. It's called Afrikaans, and they are Afrikaners. And they still speak this language to this day. And the Afrikaners saw themselves as a unique race appointed by God to civilize South Africa and to become wealthy in the process. More than 200 laws were passed detailing what jobs blacks could hold and what they could not hold. Their education ended in the eighth grade because they believed that they were too stupid. Whites believed that the blacks were too stupid to um, function at any higher levels. And the question is, why are they ever going to need math any higher than eighth grade? All they're going to have is menial jobs. Um, they were incredibly poor. They were the townships, I was in two of them, Soweto and Guguletu. And um, in some places there's no electricity, no running water, no sewage treatment, just little shacks built out of whatever scrap material you can find. And for light, they have these poles 100 feet high with incredibly bright lights on it to make it light at night. And of course, it's hard to sleep with that, but people crawl up those poles and try to hook into the electricity and get electrocuted. They had no medical care. And um, so it was, well, the whites had all of these. The whites had everything. The blacks had basically nothing. And so they, the blacks said, you know, there's 40 million of us, there's 6 million of them, what are we waiting for? And they started a movement to overthrow the white government. And that movement grew over time, and it grew a lot over time, it grew very quickly. And um, it was a time of increasing violence. Well, two men kind of rose to the leadership of these t uh, of, of the, the movement. The name given to it was the African National Con Congress, and it had a, its own military arm called Umkonto Wisizwe, meaning Spear of the Nation. A man named Nelson Mandela became head of the ANC. 
and he protested against the government. He plotted against the government. He was arrested, he was charged with treason, he was convicted, and he was sent to prison for life. He was also the head of Umkonto Wesizwe. He spent 17 of those years locked up in Robben Island prison. Robben Island is a desolate, barren rock six miles out in Table Bay at Cape Town. It was not a maximum security prison in the sense that we think of it because there was no way to escape. If you tried to swim, the great white sharks would eat you. Guaranteed. No one ever escaped that way. The only person who ever escaped successfully did so by boat. The food was terrible and what the, they had the men doing, they did everything they could to humiliate them had them sitting on pavement in the middle of the courtyard with hammers and rocks and breaking big rocks into little rocks all day long. A lot of men went blind from that because of the little rock chips flying into their eyes. There was no eye protection. Or they worked in the quarry, hand mining limestone. What the whites never knew was they also had a university going on. They believed that every prisoner had something to teach someone else. So the motto was, each one teach one. Which I think it's kind of cool. The violence got worse and worse and worse, and the people never forgot about Mandela out there in Robben Island. His guard was a man named Cristo Brand, an Afrikaner police officer. Brand sometimes wore a wire when he was in with Mandela. Well, didn't work a lot, but Mandela was transferred to Polesmore Prison on the mainland because of the political situation was getting so violent. The um, police had assassination squads, literally. Their job was to go out and find and kill opposition leaders. As a matter of fact, Christo Brand planted a bomb in the car of a man named James Zulu. Blew him up. Blew him to pieces. Sometimes they would send black officers into the townships to find the agitators to then create a cell, so to speak, and to equip them with weapons to whip them up, to get them into a car, tell the police where they were and where they were going, and ambush them. They were deliberately killing their own people. And one particular man, and I have the video of this, so I can verify all of this, was there when they ambushed his so-called cell, and he said, told one of them to surrender. And the man did walk forward and he shot him in the face to protect his own identity. This was South Africa in the 1970s and 80s and early 90s. He was all across the country. It's very dangerous. Negotiations led to Mandela finally being released in 1990, after 27 years in prison. In 1994, the apartheid government disbanded. They retracted all of the apartheid laws. The Dutch Reformed Church in 1986 recanted its heresy of, if you're black, you're evil. And everybody expected civil war because that's exactly what happened in every other country in Africa when white rule fell. They had their first democratic election ever where everybody could vote and they did. Nelson Mandela was elected president of South Africa. 
Here comes the bloodbath, we thought. No, he says, no. We cannot do that. We must not do that. We need each other to survive. At his inaugural, Cristo Brand was given a seat of honor directly behind Mandela on the inauguration stand. You want to know how great a man Mandela was? I had dinner with Brand in Cape Town, South Africa. And he said that just that day, he says, well, I've been trying, to, I've been going to universities, or to banks, trying to get loans so my son can go to university. He says, and I can't get a loan because I don't have a well-paying job anymore. He actually, I had actually met him earlier in the day and didn't realize who he was because he was the curator at the Robben Island prison where I had been and I bought a baseball cap. He says, but today, he says, the phone rang. I picked it up and it was Madiba. Now Madiba is Mandela's tribal name. He's a prince, actually, in his tribe, in the Zulu tribe. And Madiba said, I understand you're having trouble finding financing for your son to go to university. And he says, yes, I am. And Madiba said, don't worry about it. It's taken care of. Mandela paid for the university education of his jailer. What do you do with that? He formed a commission called the Truth Commission, and if you had committed any kind of violence for either side in the struggle, if you came forward, admitted your crimes, took responsibility, you would be granted permanent amnesty from prosecution. And it worked. It's, there have been 23 truth commissions around the world. This is the only one that produced any actual measurable results where people felt that they had settled something, that they had come closer together. 9,000 perpetrators came forward and admitted their crimes. 17,000 victims testified in front of each other, in front of television cameras. It was all live. You can find the transcripts on the internet. I've read through a lot of them. So there was no civil war. So I went to South, I had the opportunity to go there to study to find out why. And I did. And my guide in Johannesburg was named Tebe Magobe. He is Zulu. And I asked him, I said, Tebe, have you forgiven them? Because he had been tortured. He had been arrested. He had been tortured. He says, oh, yeah. I said, why? My Lord commands it. He was a Christian. <laughs> what do you do with that? I talked to a Muslim woman in Cape Town. She had been six months pregnant when they arrested her and said, you are either going to torture you until you abort your baby or you're going to tell us the names we want. She said, no. They tortured her for three weeks. She did not abort. Her baby was later born very healthy. And I asked her, I said, have you forgiven them? She looked at me and she says, yes, I have. I said, why? She says, it was the only way to get my life back, to take control back of my life. And I found this throughout South Africa. I mean, I found bitter people, of course. But I think the most, the greatest example was on my last night. I was at the airport in Cape Town waiting for a commuter flight up to Johannesburg. And then I was going to take the overnight flight to New York. And um, I was in the restaurant. It had been empty when I went in there. I was reading a book, and I hadn't really paid attention. And there's a gentleman standing there who says, May I join you, sir? And he has a very heavy Afrikaner accent. And I said, Yeah, sure. The place had become very crowded. He introduced himself as Ruben Sells. He's a farmer, an Afrikaner. He's lived there his whole life, born there. And he says, oh, so we got to talking. He asked, why, why was I there? And he said, and I told him, he says, ah, yeah. 
terrible thing, terrible thing. I said, what do you think of your truth commission? He says, oh, that was hard. That was hard, but it was so good. The truth came out. I said, what do you think of Nelson Mandela? He says, oh, only God and Nelson Mandela could have saved this country, and both did their jobs very well. That was the last person I spoke to in South Africa. What has changed? I mean, there's still terrible poverty there in, in many places. But now the universities are integrated. And what you're going to see is several examples of how all of this has come together to produce something amazing. I mean, absolutely amazing. We're going to go to Stellenbosch. Stellenbosch is a college town in the mountains about five, 15 miles outside of Cape Town on the South Atlantic coast. Beautiful area, just gorgeous. Um, the choir at SU, believe it or not, has been considered to be the absolute best college choir in the world. Choir in South Africa, friends, is a varsity sport. It's competitive. Oh, I am not kidding you. Stellenbosch is amazing, but you'd think that these are all music majors. No. They're studying engineering, teaching, chemistry, medicine, you name it. Why are they so good? They've competed all over the world. Why are they so good? Two things, coaching and commitment. The director coach since 2010 is Andre van der Merwe. He demands their best, works them hard, respects them totally, and they excel. And they love him because he loves them and believes in them. The first one we're going to hear a song from them was actually performed in Wales, not South Africa. It was the competition for the world championship. And they sang a song by um, uh, Christopher Tin called Baba Yetu. Baba Yetu is in Swahili. They don't speak Swahili. They speak 11 different languages in South Africa, but Swahili is not one of them. That's from Kenya, 2,600 miles to the north. Baba Yetu means Father Jehovah in Swahili. It is the Lord's Prayer in Swahili, but it's... You've never heard it like this before. Um, what, what I want you to know, notice, they're not standing still. They're not dead. I want you to notice, I want you to look for exaggerated pronunciation, passion and commitment, even though they're reciting the words from a language that's different from their own. This is blacks and whites and Indians and other uh, Malaysians all together. Their concentration, they're concentrating totally on their conductor. Their eyes never leave him. Perfection in harmony and rhythm and joy. Absolute joy. The second one is called Say Something. You probably heard it, maybe not. It was beautiful. What do you look for? Changes in volume and, and loud and soft. Again, exaggerated pronunciation, because if they do not exaggerate it, you will never understand the words. But if you have a hundred people all exaggerating exactly the same at exactly the same time, you will understand every word. The passion and the use of hard vowels. They use them for emphasis. You'll hear them. Okay? Then, angel, what to look for. It's also known as in the arms of the angels. Changes in volume, and all of these things, the passion, the use of hard vowels, the intentional dissonance, where the sounds don't work together, but it's intention, it creates a tension and then it resolves. Now, South Africa is a deeply Christian society. Unlike here, 
expressions of belief are acceptable, even expected in public meetings. When I was meeting with the commissioner of chief uh, of police in Johannesburg, um, of nine deputy commissioners, it's a huge police department for the entire province, and um, he had uh, one of the commissioners open the meeting in prayer. Huge man, Afrikaner, no less. Huge white man. His hat looked like a toy on his head. At the end of the meeting, nobody had asked this question, and I couldn't figure out why, so I did. I said, sir, can you tell me why there has not been civil war in South Africa since the fall of apartheid? And he looked a little startled, so did everybody else, and he says, I'm going to ask Commissioner, I can't remember his name, to answer that. And it was the same commissioner who had prayed. He stands up, looks very serious, clears his throat, looks out, and he says, Three words, sir. Grace, grace, and more grace. And he sat down, and the meeting was over. A Catholic priest, a Mennonite professor from the University of Pennsylvania, and I quickly cornered the guy, and I said, what did you mean? He said, ah, God's grace, of course. Nothing else could have saved us. So the song you're going to hear is Give Me Jesus. It's an old American hymn. Just enjoy it. Look, watch, listen, absorb. See what they do. See the passion in it. After that, we're going to go to a traditional African gospel medley. And they're singing in four different tribal languages, which most of them do not understand. They're doing it with great passion. What to look for? Hand and body movements. These are traditional tribal interpretations. And they're having fun. If your people aren't having fun, you're not doing it right. Okay? Then the Stellenbosch University Chamber Choir. This is a smaller group. Um, they specialize in African tribal music. Now what I want you to do is see if you can find what I call Kelsey Hawk's cousin. She's in there. Okay? Tell me who she is. Then we're going to go to the University of Pretoria Choir. As I said, there's a competition. This was in competition. It's a Zulu, excuse me, uh, Kosa, prayer for forgiveness, for killing Jesus, and for peace in the world. It's called Indodana. Um, it's simple, but incredibly moving. Um, the last thing we're going to hear, if you don't believe excellence can be achieved by ordinary people, I'm going to give you the Indolovu Youth Choir from Limpopo province in South Africa. I will let them tell their story. I think you're going to be blown away. So here's the premise, guys. Here's the assignment. Most people have the ability but do not know how to, to access it. A truly good coach can bring out their ability. React to the videos. What are the implications to worship music based on what you've witnessed? How can you improve church music using what you've just learned? Post it to the discussion board by Monday, November 2nd. Okay? Um, Nick, thank you for dropping in today. I truly enjoyed it. Looking forward to seeing the rest of you guys. Matt, Come on in. Cody, Gavin, look forward to seeing you. All right? Thanks, guys. Have a good one.